Welcome to today's ISD lecture on science and society. This series presents eminent scientists from the humanities and social sciences to an audience engaged mostly in the natural sciences and to the general public. This afternoon, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Wodak, Emerita Distinguished Professor of Discourse Studies at Lancaster University. Wodak is one of the outstanding linguists of her generation. Her focus is on sociolinguistics and discourse studies, both fields of re research that she established in Austria. Wodak's scientific career as a linguist is exceptional. To name just a few milestones and awards, she acquired her PhD Subauspices Presidentis at the University of Vienna. She was awarded the very first Wittgenstein Award when, she, when it was established in the year 1996. She holds honorary doctorates from the University of Örebro in Sweden and from Warwick University. She's a member of the British Academy of Social Sciences and of Academia Europea. I'll just name three of her books. One is The Politics of Fear, The Shameless Normalization of the Far-Right Populist Discourses. Another one, Europe at the Crossroads. And the third one, The Handbook of Language and Politics. Her most recent book in German, Österreichische Identitäten im Wandel, 1995 bis 2015, is the main output of a three-year FWF-funded project on, uh, on, on the discursive construction of Austrian identities. And this is actually the research on which today's lecture focus, focuses it's titled Renationalizing Europe, the Austrian case, 1995-2015. Thank you very much uh, for giving this lecture, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, just a quick hello from the moderator, um, Oliver Lehmann, hello. Uh, we'll be happy to take your questions after the lecture uh, by Ruth. Uh, just add them to the Q&A button. Uh, or if you have a, a German keyboard here, it's an F and A, and we'd be happy to select um, a couple of questions after the lecture. But now, Ruth, the floor is yours. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here and to be invited to speak at this uh, great occasion. Um, of course, times are very strange. Uh, we just talked before that we were all wishing for better times. Uh, but uh, this is as it is. And uh, I'm very grateful to Georg, Heilig, to Oliver, of course, and to Tom uh, for organizing this lecture in such a fantastic way. And I do hope that uh, nothing will happen during this lecture and the screens will remain as they're supposed to be. So as Tom has already said, I will be talking about a big project which we finalized one and a half years ago and the book uh, just appeared several months ago uh, about the discursive construction of Austrian identities 1995 to 2015 as a case study for uh, renationalizing tendencies uh, in Europe and the European Union. And I will first talk about some general uh, frameworks and introductory approaches. I will then briefly summarize some important aspects of the Austrian context between 95 and 2015, as I'm aware that many people who are listening or uh, watching might not uh, know as much about uh, all these interesting changes in Austria during these 20 years. I will then, ta then take you through uh, my main assumptions and give you an overview of data and methodology, uh, specifically, again, because I'm aware that uh, I'm talking to natural scientists mainly, uh, 
and this might be quite a new uh, approach to see how we deal with data, uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively uh, in discourse studies. I will then focus on two smaller cases. Uh, one is uh, the concept of so-called Integrationsunwilligkeit, uh, a very interesting word in German. German has difficult co composite words. In English, it means unwillingness to integrate, and that became a very important slogan in the year 2015 during the big movement of refugees. Uh, I will explain more about this, uh, but it will illustrate how far-right concepts have actually moved into the mainstream and into the center. And secondly, I will take you also very briefly through the changes of German language policies from 1995 to 2015, something which actually some of you might uh, be referred to, and maybe some of you actually have to do German tests if you want to uh, stay in Austria. And finally, I will conclude and open up to questions. Uh, the four names here below uh, indicate uh, the team of this project. Uh, we were four linguists, discourse analysts, and we also had an advisory board, an interdisciplinary advisory board um, out of political scientists, historians, uh, and people who work with images, uh, sort of specialists in multimodality. So, uh, the three projects which uh, we uh, actually did in 1995, 2005, and 2015 were all focused on uh, these specific years where there are very many commemorative events. And that's why they're interesting. 95, by the way, was also the year when Austria joined the uh, European Union. And uh, all these years ending with five uh, indicate that they are uh, 50 years after the end of World War II or 60 or 70 years. So these years are full of commemorative events about the founding, founding of the Austrian Republic, <clears throat> the definition of Austrian neutrality and so forth and so on. So in these years, we trace all these commemorative events, and then we compare uh, how they are conducted and which different topics are talked about, what kind of images are shown, and what is foregrounded and backgrounded. Uh, such years are always very important for the construction of national identities. What do you remember? and how do you define the present and the future? And they also give opportunity to very big speeches of the government, uh, to big celebrations and so forth. So we compared uh, all the data of these three projects uh, using basically the same and also a refined theoretical framework parallel data, but also 2015, as I will show you later on, new data like social media, which of course 1995 were not uh, part of the project because they didn't exist in this way. So of course we have many social and technical changes and innovations which we have to take care of in these 20 years. Uh, this is also the first longitudinal study of its kind. There exists no other <clears throat> study which I'm aware of, uh, of a qualitative and quantitative comparison of such 20 years in so many data sets over uh, qualitative and quantitative periods of time. So this was really a first. <clears throat> 
And uh, I think we've succeeded in showing how many contradictions also occur in such a period of time. So sometimes you have a sort of streamlined tendency uh, and sometimes we have the feeling of going to uh, two spaces uh, into uh, the future and then one back. So you never know exactly how uh, such uh, periods of time uh, will be projected. Basically, we applied the same analytical categories for all those five projects uh, because we assume that uh, national identities consist of constructions of a shared past, a myth, some kind of founding myth, some narratives of the past and of the present and visions of the future. Uh, there are always shared culture and language which are appealed to, even if it's a very diversified uh, nation state. We then have a projection of a typical Austrian. We call that the Homo Austriacus or the Femina Austriaca. What is the typical Austrian? And I'm sure you all have certain stereotypes uh, about this typical Austrian. And finally, we're talking about a national body, which on the one hand is the territory, which is always appealed to and also projected, uh, mountains, lakes, etc. But also which borders does Austria have? Are the borders open? Are they closed? Uh, and who belongs into this country and who doesn't belong. So all of these are very important features of the discursive construction of identities. And inclusion and exclusion are most important indicators of this construction. So if I summarize all this, these different features and criteria which belong to the construction of national identities, we have on the one hand, the mother tongue, which is very frequently appealed to. So what is the language of these people who live in this country? We then have different identity constructions, uh, individual, collective, transnational. We all have multiple identities. Uh, which we can foreground and background, depending on who we are talking to. Uh, we are frequently multilingual, especially in Europe, and different languages have different ideologies and values attached to them. Uh, the question of belonging, which I already referred to, is big. So who's allowed to enter and in what kind of function? migrants or refugees, privileged migrants, uh, economic migrants, um, etc. Uh, we have questions of citizenship, which are very important when constructing national identities, because belonging is defined via citizenship, via participation in elections, for example, access to specific rights and duties. And uh, if you think back to the election in Vienna, which just took, uh, which just happened some weeks ago, uh, about a third of the Viennese population was not able to vote because the vote, uh, the right to vote is tied to Austrian citizenship in this country. Other countries have different uh, laws. We then look at discourse studies, which looks at the way uh, we define and change and communicate our identities, how we convey them to other people, how we present ourselves and how we present others. We then are also looking at far right populist politics who have a very specific nativist definition of who belongs to who doesn't belong. That means going back to heritage, to uh, some kind of soil and blood 
politics and are very important in the debates about identities. And as I already mentioned, uh, different indicators of exclusion and inclusion. And all of that is context dependent. It depends on historical context, but also situational, uh, professional contexts. And uh, then we are also very much dependent of transnational and global incidents. In that way, the construction of national identities is very, um, uh, very much complex and also part and parcel of a lot of uh, indicators on many levels going from macro to micro. And this is something I will also talk about because discourse studies is mostly concerned with the micro level. But of course, we have to account for the macro level as well. So the main assumption which I will be talking about today in the period of these 20 years which we have looked at is uh, tracing the normalization of previously far-right connotated concepts due to ever more polarization of societies. That means previously far-right uh, connotated concepts, concepts used by far-right populist parties in the case of Austria by the Austrian Freedom Party have become normalized and are now being used by mainstream parties. And this has happened not only in Austria, but throughout. We can observe such normalization of far-right elements, arguments, concepts throughout the European Union and also beyond the European Union. Um, if we look to the US, for example, but uh, this would take me to a very different lecture. And I will look at this on the one hand, as I already mentioned, by looking at uh, the unwillingness to integrate uh, and also by the salience of German language uh, for the construction of Austrian identities. Now, let me briefly look at Austrian contexts. Uh, first, 1995, uh, Austria was at that time defined as not being a country of immigration. Although if you look back to the Austrian monarchy, Austria was of course always a country of immigration and emigration and was always diverse and multilingual. However, at that time, Austria was defined as being not a country of immigration. EU membership was uh, perceived by many as a threat or an opportunity, although the election for the EU had a huge number of positive votes, over 65%. Uh, Austria took in 90,000 refugees from Bosnia during the Yugoslav Wars, which happened in the 90s, as you are probably aware of. But at the same time, after 1989, there was a big fear of Eastern Europeans. So the, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, 1989, there was a real uh, frame shift. And suddenly, uh, Eastern Europeans, and I mean Romanians, Poles, Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, who had always been welcomed, especially as refugees from the former communist countries, were suddenly not welcomed. They, uh, people were afraid their jobs would be taken away, uh, salaries would be lowered, and uh, suddenly uh, there was a lot of xenophobic attitudes. At the same time, on the 26th of March 1995, we, uh, the Schengen Treaty was approved, and you know that that means open borders. So already at that time, the contradiction between closed and open borders had started. Uh, 
also we had big fears of losing our cultural identity to Germany, the fear of a so-called second Anschluss. Uh, and I remember many people calling us at my department of linguistics, asking us if the Austrian German would now be forbidden and we would all have to talk Hochdeutsch. And you might know that in the treaties to uh, the Austrian accession, there are 23 Austrian German words which are part of that treaty. And not surprisingly, most of them belong to the area of food, uh, which is, I think, quite typical and interesting. Now, if we jump to 2015, we have a different picture. We have the perception of the refugee crisis as a huge international threat. So the Eastern Europeans have become more or less integrated. Uh, but now we have, uh, we are, have attitudes, very strong attitudes against refugees coming from the East. These are now basically and mostly Muslims uh, from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, but also from Africa, Somalia, Sudan, etc. And uh, the fear is basically, as it is expressed, of being replaced by migrants and refugees, by being swamped by uh, these people who are strange and who adhere to a different culture. But interestingly, the discursive patterns were very much the same as in 1995. Uh, They're just a different group which is excluded. Uh, but the discourse is quite similar. German language competence has become much more important, as I will be showing you. And we have a big debate about closing borders and building fences, which hasn't stopped ever since. As you might know, there is much debate about protecting the borders of the EU, about Frontex, and so forth and so on. So after the refugee movement 2016, this fear hasn't stopped and there are big divisions in societies and across the EU about this topic. Now, looking at the data which uh, we investigated, um, it's important for me to show you that we have very different genres which we uh, analyze starting from commemorative speeches at certain very important events, which we could compare quantitatively and qualitatively. Many media texts, traditional quality media, but also tabloids uh, with about 16,733 articles, for example, in 2015. We looked at TV and radio broadcasts, which have to be transcribed very carefully. Advertisements for exhibitions for, for example, May 15 or for the day commemorating uh, the liberation of the concentration camp Mauthausen or for the foundation of the Austrian Republic. Uh, there are many exhibitions where we look at the catalogs. But then we also have a very specific way of organizing our data and collecting them through group discussions. That means focus groups, uh, which we made in all uh, nine regions of Austria and also in uh, young people in schools, uh, gymnasium, but also uh, secondary schools and also uh, different professions. And we always have one focus group with uh, privileged migrants. That means people who work in Austria, but they work in the UN or are diplomats. That means they are different kind of privileged migrants than those migrants which uh, are frequently not perceived as belonging here. Finally, uh, we have we conduct interviews with people from these focus groups, 
but also some prominent people. For example, uh, 2015, we also interviewed then President Hans Fischer. We interviewed certain media, famous media people. Uh, we interviewed uh, members of parliament, all of them asking them, what does Austrian identity uh, mean for you? What does it consist of? Then we look at party programs and uh, the def definition of national identity in these programs and into the legislation. Now, the different genres imply very different methods of analysis because you cannot analyze a group discussion in a quantitative way, except maybe counting some very banal indicators like I and you, but it's very difficult to quantify arguments or interruptions or all the specificities of spoken discourse. Uh, but of course you can quantify media texts and we have to apply different methods for the different genres. In that way, the project become very complex. So as I already mentioned, we have this kind of multi-level analysis. Uh, we, uh, we conduct our analysis in the discourse historical approach. That means that we always view texts as being historical and non-isolated, as having certain uh, relationships with other speeches or other uh, incidents before or also simultaneously or uh, <clears throat> also showing us to the future. We look at different context levels as they might influence uh, speakers or viewers or interviewers or interviewees. We also applied conceptual history in looking at the various concepts, these like uh, the unwillingness to integrate. And finally, we have uh, quantified uh, our uh, text via corpus linguistics. This is specific softwares which we also developed in Lancaster and which allow non uh, sort of inductive ways of analyzing texts and not uh, implementing or uh, putting using some categories which you uh, use to uh, interpret the text. That means we quantify indicators of the text itself without a first level of interpretation. I think this is a very important way of uh, quantification and I will show you more about this. I come to my first case study, the unwillingness to integrate. Uh, we focused on a so-called discourse strand. That means a discourse with a beginning and an end. Uh, we looked at the beginning of 2015, where suddenly the discourse about Integrationsunwilligkeit popped up after the terror acts of Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Suddenly, politicians and media started to discuss why children wouldn't want to integrate. And this term, which had been only used previously in the Austrian Freedom Party, popped up in mainstream discourse. So we were very interested in the struggle over meanings in context and about the legitimation of the use of such concepts, basically tracing the history of meaning making. Now, the first step when you look at such uh, conceptual histories is to look at the definition of what integration means, because that is a floating signifier. Many people believe that integration means something very different. And this is why I point to here to a definition by the very uh, famous sociologist and political scientist Klaus Offe, who defines integration as follows. In the context of 
of migration and migration policy. This multifaceted sociological concept is best reconstructed as a deal. The parties to the deal are two. We, the society of the country of arrival, i.e. Austria in this case, its representative institution and administrative agencies, and you, the migrant, the multitude of people who have irregularly crossed our borders in search for protection and a life free of fear. The content of the deal is, in its most simplistic form, we provide, you behave. Now, this is a very interesting definition because it already uh, contains the concept of power. That means if you come to us, you have to adapt to us. You have to adapt to our culture, to our language. And this is the hegemonic definition of integration. Of course, there are also many other definitions put forward by different political positions. The deal, which Offe mentions here, could be defined as a more, much more equal deal. We adapt to each other, for example or we accept you, we respect you, as long as you don't, uh, don't damage any of our laws or violate any of our laws, etc. So we could also, of course, uh, imagine very different definitions, but this is the hegemonic state definition, the definition in the institutions. And because this is the case, we also can define the norms which are expected from migrants. So the far right opposition party, Freedom Party, FPÖ, as we then investigated, has been using this term, uh, refusal to integrate or unwillingness to integrate since the 1990s ever since the fall of the Iron Curtain, ever since the migrants from Eastern European countries uh, immigrated into Austria. And 2015, after the terrorist attack on the Charlie Hebdo uh, newspaper and weekly magazine, uh, there was a perceived threat of Islamist terrorism and extensive news coverage about 15 to 16 year olds joining ISIS. And uh, in that way, suddenly there was a big discussion on children and especially young men in schools who were not integrating or who were not willing to integrate. And thus following this French debate, uh, that was sort of recontextualized in Austria. And looking at uh, Google Analytics first to see the average use of integrations unwillig in all its grammatical forms, we see that from 2005, where it was used very rarely on the web, which looks at all the incidents of use in newspapers, books, articles, etc., etc. we see that suddenly 2015, we have peaks. Now we were interested in what happened and how did this concept really uh, enter the mainstream and what was the trajectory of this concept? What has changed in these 10 or 20 years? So we looked at the first interview given by a politician about uh, Integrations Unwilligkeit, interestingly, a politician from the Social Democratic Party, who was at that time uh, the governor of the district govern regional governor of Styria. And here you can deconstruct the argument very clearly. So uh, Vovis says the following in an interview. This really dramatic terror attack on an editorial office in Paris leads me to say clearly that politics in Europe has looked away far too long. So this is the claim 
That is, when people come to Europe, to Austria, who are religiously motivated to infiltrate our values. So this is now the threat scenario. They come not to live a better life, but they come in order to infiltrate our values uh, and live and demonstrate this to us, the native Austrians. So you immediately have the distinction between us and them. Europeans in their living environment and therefore show no willingness to really want to integrate. There we should realign our rule of law differently. So once we, uh, once we have looked away too long, this is why we have to do something now, because there are these people who come. And actually, due to the terror attack, which very, very terribly happened uh, a bit more than two weeks ago in Vienna, we actually have uh, this debate um, polarizing, dominating our media and politics again. So what did we do to trace uh, the trajectory of this concept? We looked at a lot of different genres again. We looked at print media and on legislation and also on, uh, sorry, on the uh, legislation and parliamentary debates. And we came up with a huge amount of words, which we were also able to analyze in this corporal linguistic way, but also qualitatively, of course. So uh, you see that we have um, this huge corpus and we have sub corpora, uh, the constitutional court, the federal asylum uh, senate, the asylum court, so you have to look at the uh, various subsets and then we can also generalize to uh, the big data set. What we see now in a second uh, sort of uh, analysis is that the concept of being willing to integrate uh, starts here in 2002, has a big peak 2006-7 which is very interesting and we can ask why is that the case and then it falls uh, strongly and never reaches that peak again. So uh, we have to ask what happened 2006 uh, and the second uh, interesting result is that we have uh, integ integrations unwilligkeit, unwillingness to integrate. And here we see uh, the big peak, as we already saw before, 2015, but then also 2017. So after the so called refugee crisis, this has become part and parcel of the debates, but specifically it has become part of legislation. That means it has left uh, the political sphere and parliamentary debates and has been adapted in legislation and legal discourse. And the same is true here, because in this years, the first uh, laws were also implemented on uh, learning German and the so-called uh, contract to integrate, Integrationsvereinbarung, where migrants have to sign a uh, contract if they want to remain in Austria. So to just show you one of the re resolutions of parliament um, from 2015, uh, we have People now in this debate, people who do not accept this order of values are partly trying to build up a parallel society and that causes fear and anger. In the future, it should also be the task of Styrian politics, not only to further promote integration, but also to think about how to deal with unwillingness to integrate. So now we are talking about legal measures. Uh, 
So it's not only danger, but now it's the question of what do we do about that? And the government then decided it is necessary to be able to punish unwillingness to integrate. For this purpose, a commission is to be set up in Styria, consisting of experts in this area, as well as lawyer, with whose help crimes of unwillingness to integrate and legal possibilities of the punishment shall be defined. Now, what is the crime? The crime is not to adapt to Austrian values, to that what is defined as being Austrian, from school children, because these laws were mainly focused first on behavior of school children, and it meant boys who didn't want to shake the hands of female teachers and girls who didn't, Muslim girls who didn't want to go to swim with other girls. Uh, these were basically the most important, thank you, Oliver, the most important. Um, uh, features. Uh, now, what we have as a result of that is uh, instead of integration, we have laws which discipline and control, enforcing assimilation. We first had integration through achievement. If you were a very good scholar, then we had integration through learning the German language. And finally, now, we still have integration through punishment in schools. I'm talking about school children now, and these laws apply to uh, school children from the age from 10 to 15, 16. And uh, the law is now a draft which goes to the Ministry of Social Affairs in 2019. I will very quickly, as I have been told, I only have five minutes, it might be seven. Uh, I will quickly talk about German language competence because this is related to the unwillingness to integrate for school children and migrants. Uh, before 19, the 1990s, the German language was not part of citizenship laws. So you could also become an Austrian citizen without passing a German language test or proving your German language skills. But 2003, uh, the first uh, law came up that you need to know German A1 level of the common European framework uh, before entering the country. That meant if you wanted to migrate to Austria, let's say from somewhere in the world, you had to pass a certified German test, uh, in, probably in the capital of that uh, country. And only then were you able to go to the embassy, apply for a visa, and then enter the country. But uh, the embassy could still not permit you to uh, and not give you the visa because there were also other criteria which were important. And there was a huge debate about having to give evidence of the A1 level of understanding enough German in, in kind of greeting, saying hello and asking where uh, an address is or asking for names. So it's very simple German A1 level. Uh, in on the first first 2006 that became a2 and now we have uh, b1 which is kind of a high school level of German knowledge uh, in five years after you have entered the country there are of course exceptions like scientists diplomats journalists and key workers workers migrants who work in key professions, uh, which are so important like caretakers or nurses, etc., that they don't have to have these German skills, which is quite interesting because nurses should actually be able and doctors to talk to their patients. But uh, this is the way uh, the law is um, constructed that there's lots of critique by linguistic and educational experts 
who say that written tests are not suitable for mapping linguistic needs, that the tests exclude less literate people, and Austria probably has about almost a million of functionally illiterate people in Austria, which also includes autochtonic Austrians, sort of real Austrians, not only migrants, which is a huge number. And that ultimately the result of these practices is discrimination based on linguistic criteria or language becomes a gatekeeper. So if we look at unwillingness to integrate plus the gatekeeping of language, we come to a very clear image of what the hegemonic Austrian identity construction now looks at like. And just to show you uh, the trajectory uh, in a kind of heuristic graph, we have a concept which uh, starts out in far right discourse, is then recontextualized in different genres, like I showed you in postings, interviews, laws, uh, and then basically also in textbooks and in different social fields and finally arrives in the mainstream. And this is what we have tried to trace in this project with many such concepts and also through many genres. I've only been able to show you that very briefly with two examples. So to conclude, I just have two more slides. One is the longitudinal perspectives, the most important results. We have an increasing importance of global transnational national contexts and influences on discourses about identities. Austria is not the island of the privileged. It is part and parcel of Europe and, of course, global influences, European influences are all part of what we all experience. And of course, the pandemic right now is a good example. There is an increasing importance of Europeanization, 95 accession to the EU. Now we are part of the EU and a rise of skepticism. We have increasing importance of identity politics instead of uh, traditional left-right politics regarding Austrian-German, religion, gender, and so forth. And we have increasing importance of transnational commemoration of the Holocaust and World War II. I was not able to show you examples of this. Basically, we have an increasing culturalist definitions of nationhood instead of state national elements like, uh, like citizenship, rules of law, etc. And I want to conclude uh, by juxtaposing two images of what one could uh, imagine as being Austrian uh, from the election campaign 2016, our now president from the former Green Party, uh, now independent, who defined Heimat, homeland, as uh, something which we love and don't polarize, or there is no uh, divisiveness, and the then candidate from the Freedom Party, who says we have to stand up for Austria, your country needs you now, and Austria was only for Austrians, Muslims, and non Christians were not. Uh, defined as Austrians. So in that way, we have contradictions. On the one hand, we are becoming more European. On the other hand, we are becoming more nationalist. And this is true for all of Europe, and especially this was visible in the pandemic, where suddenly the borders closed. Uh, each nation state thought they could manage the crisis themselves. And I hope that now in the second wave of the crisis, we will not experience even more renationalization. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. Uh, this was uh, extremely exciting and interesting. Um, 
And uh, I assume uh, there are some questions that will come up in this context. Uh, but uh, before we go there specifically, let me use this position, I mean, this privileged position to, to ask you, um, and maybe ask you to, to uh, focus once more on what the specific Austrian aspect of these politics of fear is. Uh, I'm pointing also to the book in the backdrop. Uh, we will have the details actually on our homepage. But uh, asking you this question, I will quote uh, the Austrian historian Friedrich Heer, who in the 1970s or 80s, I think it was in his book, uh, The Struggle for Austrian Identity, um, actually wrote, I think it even was his very, it's the very first sentence saying, there is no historical entity in Europe whose existence is so closely linked to the identity problems of its members as Austria. Is it that what sets this Austrian, this debate of renationalization in the European context, Austria apart from the other nations? Or is there an, another kind of specific aspect? Are you asking me now, right? Right. Good. Um, I don't think this is uh, specifically Austrian now. Uh, I would say at the time when Friedrich Herr uh, wrote that, uh, he certainly pointed to uh, the fragility and vulnerability of sort of an hegemonic Austrian identity after World War II and World War I, we know of the interwar period where Austrians didn't really believe that Austrian would exist and survive. And after World War II, uh, trying to distinguish, distinguish oneself as much as possible from Germany, especially because of participation, non-participation in war crimes and in Nazism and World War II. So there was a lot of fragility of what does it mean to be Austrian and can one actually be proud of this country? What, how, what kind of stance can one have and will it be possible to again build up this republic after everything what had happened, which was also not talked about. That was also quite an Austrian feature. Nowadays, uh, I would say this is quite a European tendency. If you look at Hungary or some of the Visegrad states, you see that the fear of decline is very big. Uh, if you listen to Orban or also Kaczynski and others, uh, they, they talk about the fear of decline, the fear that the real Hungarians would die out, also because many of them emigrate. And uh, there's also a law now in Hungary that uh, Hungarian women should, should get more Hungarian children. And uh, in that way, uh, this sort of vulnerability of uh, national identities has become quite a European phenomenon. Plus uh, the experience both of the financial crisis and then the so-called refugee crisis which has shaken up all countries in different ways and to a different extent. And many countries, especially the far right, where the fear of refugees or so-called illegal migrants, which are not Christian, has become a main trope. Uh, so the defending Europe or even using the connotated, very connotated slogan of Fortress Europe has become part and parcel of the debate. So I would see also a change uh, of these very important words of Friedrich Herr. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Just to point out that uh, you still have the opportunity to add questions to the Q&A uh, with the Q&A button. Um, I'm going to one question here. Uh, asking how is the differentiation between EU citizens and non-EU citizens perceived in Austria with, with respect to migration or immigration? Is there a distinction or is the distinction rather between northerners and southerners based on religion or any other criteria? It, it depends very much uh, 
where such on the context where which differences are made and of course it also depends on what kind of migrant you are and i don't only mean third world countries and eu citizens but also what kind of profession do you have are you a privileged migrant are you uh, an academic uh, a doctor etc a scientist or are you uh, going to work in the fields or uh, work in the tourism industry etc so there are very big differences to be made a what kind of profession why are you coming here and then there are different rights which uh, these citizens have all uh, foreigners eu citizens and non-eu uh, foreigners cannot vote in national or regional elections but eu citizens can vote in uh, communal elections or in the district yeah in the bezirksvertretung eu citizens can vote uh, then the second thing is there are differences in um, uh, in mobility of course so if you come from an eu country you don't have to sign this integrationsvereinbarung uh, and you don't have to know German. Uh, you don't have to have A1 before you come and then pass all these tests. Uh, you only have to do that if you are a non-EU citizen, except again, if you're such a privileged migrant. Uh, and uh, the, there is no difference in rights and duties legally between religious groups, but there are very different attitudes towards different religious groups. And again, this is also linked to um, uh, profession and uh, what kind of, if you're rich or poor. So basically in Austria, we have, uh, there's a law against wearing the burqa. So you're not allowed to cover uh your face except now with the masks that's quite interesting uh because now we are punished if we don't wear the masks and then you were punished if you wore a burqa but i mean that's the way life goes anyway so there's a law against uh put have putting on a burqa but very rich saudi tourists were not punished so uh and they're uh, the rich uh saudi women were allowed to wear the burqa and uh go in in, in uh, very good and expensive hotels so the, there are very fine distinctions on many levels some of them are legally sort of certified and others are much more conventional and uh also based on con uh, traditions on of exclusion and inclusion Okay, thank you. Um, another very interesting question here, basically uh, coming to an end and, and maybe giving an outlook here is, are there also counter examples of countries in Europe that acted less nationalistic uh, during the so called refugee uh, crisis, but also um, in the very recent past? And would you be rather optimistic or pessimistic regarding the future developments? And I suppose we shouldn't only uh, look at Europe in this context, maybe the other countries we should refer to well uh, there are countries which uh, be sort of uh, were different uh, in respect to uh, welcoming refugees uh, after 2015-16 uh, it must be emphasized that austria was very welcoming and that is actually a success story and there are two narratives which exist side by side now. Uh, I will summarize these very briefly. The one narrative is uh, it was a catastrophe. We were overwhelmed by refugees and migrants. Many of them were not refugees. Uh, many of them didn't want to integrate, didn't adapt to our culture, uh, and uh, actually uh, abused our system. The other narrative is these were refugees. We did a great job. The civil society was fantastic. Uh, many of them have integrated. They have found new lives and uh, 
the many asylum seekers were accepted and uh, are now, um, I mean, it's very difficult, but have become a part of Austrian society. These narratives exist side by side. And uh, I think this is true for most countries, you from the US to uh, Austria, Germany, everywhere, there was a big uh, backlash after 2015-16, specifically in Austria, Germany, and Sweden from the far right, uh, and uh, a mobilization of people uh, against uh, the welcoming and integration of refugees. Uh, so the far right in Germany would never have had the success it had without the refugee crisis, IFD. Uh, Sweden very reluctantly closed its borders and there was a very moving press conference where the minister of integration actually started crying during that press conference, a very unique incident uh, where a politician was so emotional and said it's terrible for her that they have to close the borders, but they just cannot uh, take any more refugees. And right now, many of you will have followed the debate about Moria and the Greek islands and the young refugees, the unaccompanied adolescents, uh, and Germany, Luxembourg, uh, the Netherlands, France, and Spain have taken children and the other countries have not taken children. So uh, in summary, um, I am not very optimistic. I think it depends very strongly on what the pandemic, how long the pandemic will last. There will be a huge economic crisis. We are already in it. It will become bigger. And in such situations, um, there is very little room for refugees. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, for this uh, extremely interesting talk. Um, uh, we are ending here on a on a on a uh, on a um, note that is uh, that, that's a differentiation, which is understandable in the context of these questions, which we have discussed. Let me just indicate to our audience. Um, to go to the homepage of ISD Austria, where on the one hand, regarding this lecture, you will find um, the references to the books, which um, you recently published. Also in due time, we'll have a recording of this lecture available um, to follow up on a couple of uh, aspects uh, we've been um, hearing now. And uh, on the ISD website, you will also find uh, more hints for talks and lectures, uh, also in the newsletter, in our uh, newsletter we publish bi-weekly. Ruth, you wanted would, to come in. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you very much and uh, convey to uh, people, because I wasn't able to answer all the questions, I've just seen there are still some available, that they can of course write to me. I don't reply immediately, but I promise to reply. Thank you very much. Thank you for that offer. And uh, with this, I wish you a good evening to all of you and uh, hope to see you soon at the next ISD lecture. Thank you, Ruth, once more. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.